everybody being here on an early Monday morning. Before I uh, introduce and bring on our uh, Office of the Auditor General, I just want to thank the Deputy Chair, uh, uh, MLA Glumack and the team uh, for, for holding down the fort for the last couple of meetings where I was unavailable. So thank you very much, Rick, uh, for your help there. Appreciate that. And uh, we're moving forward then today. We have a uh, review and consideration from the Office of the Auditor General for the Auditor General's status report. So some of the stuff that we've talked about and covered off in previous, but now it's compiled into this status report. It's um, great to see everyone here, uh, Michael and his team as well. Um, thank you very much. And, and Carl, of course, we always have the uh, Comptroller uh, Office of the Comptroller General here with Carl Fisher. Thank you for joining us uh, on an early Monday morning. Uh, without further ado, I'll uh, we'll get Michael uh, pick up on and we will start moving forward. So thank you, Michael, for you and your team being here. And as always, I'll leave it to you to introduce uh, who will be helping you out today. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you. And uh, nice to see you uh, again uh, as well, Chair. And um, before I begin introducing folks and um, a few thank you uh, for folks as well, I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you today uh, in Victoria from the ter territory of the Sanjis, the Kwankan and Esquimalt uh, people. Uh, as a member of the Myopakek First Nation myself, uh, it's very important for me to be remind, to remind myself of that every day as I um, do my lovely walks that I've often mentioned that I do and make sure I get to the water every day uh, and near to the woods every day as well, uh, very important to me. So I do want to uh, acknowledge that. I also wanted to um, acknowledge that May 17th is the um, International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biphobia as well, observed in 132 countries, and I work hard personally and professionally um, to make sure we, uh, court, we acknowledge that and we work towards a world that has uh, less bad things for these groups of people um, that are members of these groups uh, in it. So I do want to acknowledge that as well. And uh, I want to thank the folks that are with me today that uh, did all the, uh, did all the work to to get us here today i want to thank russ jones deputy auditor general whom you all uh, know well, Macam Gaston, Assistant Auditor General. You're getting used to um, to seeing him as well, uh, and some of these other folks you're getting used to seeing. Renee Peltier, the Executive uh, Director from the Performance Audit Portfolio. Laura Had, Executive Director from the Performance Audit Portfolio. And joining us, I'm pleased, also joining us today is uh, Jesse Giles, who is a manager in the performance audit um, and was really instrumental um, in, in getting this work done and doing our first status report. So I very much want to thank her and she's going to walk through the presentation in a little while. I also want to thank the folks who are, are not on this call with us um, who contributed to getting this done as well, um, namely Sheila Dodd, Stuart Newton, Jane Bryant, Amy Hart, Jackie McDonald, Mark Castador, Laura Pierce, Lisa Savigny, Forrest Joy, Emily Yearwood Lee, and of course, um, our communications and IT folks who help us get, us get us here and the many admin folks who look after us as well. And I think it was worth taking 15 seconds to do that because it just demonstrates, uh, although you see us all of the time, it's, it's how many people are actually uh, involved in all of this. So so I want to thank each and every one of them who may be listening in on the, uh, on the call today. So with that, I think I'm we're going to turn it over to uh, Jesse Giles, who's going to walk through a fairly brief presentation, and then we'll be pleased to take your questions on this report. Sorry, Jesse, just unmute. How's this? Better? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the purpose of my presentation is to give you some context uh, regarding the Auditor General uh, status report. I don't plan to cover government's activities related to the topics discussed in the report. For that information, uh, you would refer to the entities themselves. So I, I plan to cover three things in during my presentation. Why we did this report, why our audit plans change, including what factors uh, into the complexity of an audit and the time we spend, and a few examples of audits that have changed status that are discussed in the report. So first, the why. This was the first time we've done this type of report. It is part of our broader strategy to enhance communication to you, the MLAs and the public and the entities we audit about our work. 
we created this report to be transparent by providing updates on some of our performance audits that have changed course from what was originally planned as outlined in our performance audit coverage plan. You may recall from our office's presentation a few weeks ago, we publish an annual report on current and planned uh, performance audits. Uh, the performance audit coverage plan does include some information uh, regarding the performance audits that have uh, changed course. Um, but we wanted to provide some more information uh, regarding some of the performance audits that have changed course where we have received recent questions from you, um, other MLAs, um, or the public. There can be many reasons why uh, the status of an audit changes. Uh, fundamentally, it's about us making decisions uh, to use our limited resources wisely. We do this by focusing our audit work on areas of greatest significance, relevance, and risk throughout the planning and conducting of our audits. Uh, we use the term significance, um, or when we use the term significance, pardon me, we're not only speaking about financial significance, but we're also uh, speaking about potential or known impacts on people living in BC, the environment, and the economy. Uh, when we use the term risk, we are referring to risks organizations face in operating efficiently, economically, and effectively. We also have to consider our resources and the complexity of the subject we are auditing. The more complex and technical the subject matter, the more resources are required. For example, conducting an audit on the expenses of a school district requires less resources or, uh, because there's a smaller audit team uh, that's needed and we've done this type of work before. Uh, and there's also a more clear criteria to audit against. But conducting an audit on the opiate crisis, for example, requires more resources and time as the topic is complex. There are multiple entities involved and the subject matter is technical. When planning and conducting an audit, we also consider our impact on those that we audit. Our approach during the pandemic has been to think through how we can provide valuable information to you while listening to government when they've raised concerns about being able to respond to an audit and COVID-19 pandemic. This has meant postponing some of our health audits, like the audit related to the opiate crisis, because government told us proceeding as planned could have diverted critical resources and focus away from cl clinical care and the COVID-19 response. We also consider whether the process we follow will give us enough information to feel confident that we have been able to obtain all the relevant facts and haven't missed anything substantial. This can require us to adapt our approach to a changing environment so the results of our work are relevant and add value. In some cases, this means we have to delay our work so we consider the most relevant and up-to-date information. For example, on the management of spills audit, we learned that major program, the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy is implementing new software and changing its business processes for managing hazardous spills. Postponing will allow us to reflect those changes in the audit. Uh, there are other reasons why we delay. In some cases, once we start our planning work, we realize that the information is not available uh, to conduct the audit. Uh, this happened uh, when we started to plan the audit uh, around gender pay equity um, in the public service. It, it turns out uh, that an up-to-date policy on uh, pay equity that we could audit against was not in place. Uh, this meant that we couldn't uh, conclude, we couldn't conduct the audit. But we did report our preliminary findings uh, and analysis to the public service agency, uh, including suggestions on additional data uh, the government may wish to collect. We see this as adding value and we'll consider this work as we choose topics in the future. And you may recall that in our performance audit coverage plan where we discuss some of the lenses that we use when we choose our work. So that wraps up my summary of the plan. Uh, I'll now turn it back to the Auditor General for any questions and closing comments. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, ac excellent summary and uh, appreciate you doing that. So, so I think, Chair, um, that, was, that would probably conclude our introductory comments and I'm uh, happy to take questions or comments or feedback or any, any of the above and all of the above. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael. And um, so again, we'll look around to see if there's anybody uh, that wishes to ask a question. Um, while I'm waiting to see if anybody else is going to ask, I just, I just have a question myself. 
Um, so when we talk about the delays, especially when you're working, you know, with a, um, one of the government agencies, how often take, how do I put this, take the uh, COVID-19 pandemic out of the, the mix uh, of this question, but how often does your office, let's say, challenge a delay request? So if you're looking at a different ministry or a government agency uh, for one of your audits and they come back and say, look, we, we actually request that you don't audit us right now or delay for X, Y, and Z. How often does your department say, actually, no, we do want to audit and this is why in order to meet not only our mandate, but something that we feel is important for the public uh, to get information out. Is that something that you do? Yeah, let me give you uh, give, give you my take on that and my experience with that, and certainly welcome uh, my colleagues if they want to uh, to add to it as well. Um, I, I would think for the most part, um, delays outside of the pandemic, delay delays to audits um, have to be sensible and defensible. So if somebody comes to us and says, "Look, we've just scrapped this program." you're gonna come audit a program that we've just eliminated. We would really have to say, okay, what is the value add then of doing that? Uh, is this, there, it, there could be, it could be something that the legislature might wanna know that X dollars got spent and something got scrapped, but it would have to be something really defensible. Um, it can't just be that you know governments are going through change or typical change or there's competing priorities. Audits, audits are always gonna be a burden uh, to some extent on those we audit. We work to minimize that, but you know, it's um, we don't just pass on doing an audit because the, the timing um, may not be great. So I would say the number of audits that actually get delayed or postponed because of you know a a request um, that doesn't that wouldn't necessarily you know pass our bar are fairly minimal um, in in my experience. Typically, when some when a government comes to request, it makes sense significant change to a program or something like the pandemic now. So that so that's been um, that's been my experience uh, over the years. But certainly, Russ or Malcolm or, or Renee or Laura or Jesse, if you want to add to that or give a different view, um, please please do. Jump in. Uh, I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing others jump in. So, um, <laughs> so I guess I don't need to be adjusted slash cor corrected uh, um, yet this morning. So, we'll give that to 8:30. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I appreciate that. And then, you know, it's just more of uh, not only myself, I guess, being newer onto the committee and, and as the chair, but trying to understand just the process internally that you follow. Uh, when you're trying to make your decisions around audits as well. So on that kind of similar train, uh, for you internally, Michael, in your office, uh, and I'll use the gender pay equity one as an example on, on this list, uh, when do you decide to say, okay, now we've gone through this process and we're there, we've done some recommendations, but we realize now that, you know, because a lot of these uh, we've put down that the... the uh, yeah, you know, I'm looking at how long you're looking at bringing them back and you don't know on a lot of them, but for the gender pay equity, uh, it looks like you might not follow through with this uh, any further if I'm looking at how you put it forward because of the different limitations. So how, when do you remove it from your list and, and basically publicly through us say, we've now decided uh, through our office, we're not going to be doing this audit it is now off of our, uh, our plan. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, on this one, to, to talk specifics about the gender uh, pay equity one, which which predates me in terms of, you know, uh, the, the decision uh, to postpone that. So rather than giving you sort of generic information, I'll ask, uh, I think, Renee, you want to take um, you want to take that one? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So with the gender pay equity, um, the issue with, that we ran into was that the, the policy there wasn't a policy in place on gender pay equity. Um, so the so government hadn't um, established what data elements they needed to collect and what, what analysis they need to do. Um, so we, we continue to monitor to see where government is with it developing and implementing a gender-based uh, pay equity uh, policy and model. Um, and when, when they do have something in place, we, we are still considering whether that is something we wanna come back and audit. So it's not, not off off, um, however, a lot of these, you know, gender-based pay equity, for example, it really depends on when government gets to implementing sufficient 
uh, policies, processes, and controls for us to be able to have the conditions to do an audit. Thank you, Renee. Yeah, thank you. Like just on the on the report you put forward, of course, you had an end date of 2019, but we have the explanation of why that's not uh, following through with that. Uh, and the reason why I asked that question too is, you know, there's many on here where you have your restart dates just listed as unknowns. And I understand the reason why based on the explanations you put forward. Um, so Michael, through, through to you and your team then. So um, as, what's the reporting process when you to back to our committee when you decide to take that from an unknown to an active uh, audit case? So the way the way we've been doing it now, if something um, becomes unknown and it moves to becoming on the performance audit coverage plan, we would be picking that up in the performance audit coverage plan to say, you know, here is something that is on now and here is something that's removed. And the performance audit coverage plan, we've been, of course, making public and we, we have had a meeting on that as well. I, I, I would just throw another thought out there, you know, partially why, why we are doing this and put this information out there. Um, you know, we had invested um, you know time in planning and time in working with the organization and had issued them um, had issued them some comments um, for their use for internal use um, things that we uh, things that came up during the course of the work um, of course you know this is one piece of information you have Renee Renee talked about you know us waiting or putting this off because of policy development and I suppose if you know if that is a topic for example um, that interests the committee, you know, we, we've provided some information um, and then it's, you know, up to committees to consider, for example, whether that is something they would want to talk to the, uh, to the government itself about in terms of the officials running the program to say, you know, um, the Auditor General stopped an audit on this area because you were working on policy development. Hey, we would like a little bit of an update on this and we'd like to know a little bit uh, more about this and what's happening with this. That's partially why we're doing this, not to direct the committee, obviously, but to supply you with information that may be useful. Uh, in the work you're doing. So if we hit on a topic here that you say, well, you know, we want more than this. And I think that was why Jesse, you know, gave the initial comments when she was providing the overview is, you know, this is very limited information uh, at a point in time when we made a decision, but certainly opens the door for the committee and any deliberations and considerations they may want to have in terms of uh, interaction with government is uh, if that is something the committee chooses. So I did just want to offer that. Thank you. Um, any hands raised from the committee then? Anybody have specific questions on any of this? I see a bunch of heads shaking. Um, I do want to then just ask uh, one more for myself if uh, I can. It's more of just, first of all, thank you to you and and your team. When I, when I read through this again, uh, you know, I, I've always known uh, being part of audits before how technical, in-depth, and time-consuming audits can be. Uh, but looking at these ones that you've presented today as well in the status update, uh, even though some of these, the restart dates, let's say, are unknown, there's still been thousands and thousands of hours that have been spent through your, uh, through your office and through your staff on a lot of these. And so that's why it's not, I don't want to flag it as, as a concern, it's more of an acknowledgement of the amount of work that's going on behind the scenes, even though a report has not been finalized and presented yet, uh, just goes to show that uh, I guess how how important it is even through your office in my eyes uh, to be on top of this so you don't waste more time uh, on a planning perspective uh, before you actually get into a full in-depth audit, I guess, once there's an opportunity. But I look at, I'll flag one if I could, and it's something um, Site C. For instance, that one there, the performance audit plan was originally announced five years ago. And so it's still with an unknown restart date. And so that one there for me, for instance, I, I'm trying to understand what the audit would entail now when we're already, let's say, halfway through a project. So now the whole idea of the audit to begin with and the scope of what your office would be doing, you would think would be almost, um, uh, I know you said you want, there's other audits going on and changes within government and within BC Hydro, 
Uh, but what would you actually look at auditing now? And would it be waiting till the project is finished? I'm trying to understand maybe where your office's mindset would be on on why you would continue, uh, why you wouldn't do it now uh, through the start or through the work of the project, or when you actually think it would be a relevant time. I have I have to tell you, Chair, auditors love these types of uh, questions because it gives us a chance um, to talk about audit. Thank you. So so perhaps what I'll do is um, ask Laura Hatt um, to walk through where we are now and maybe even, Laura, address sort of that audit process issue and then make it uh, specific um, to Site C uh, as well in terms of uh, where we are. Uh, yes, of course. Thank you, Chair. Um, and Michael, I, yeah, Site C is obviously a really significant project for the provincial government, and it is a long term mega project and still something that we have started work on um, and have kept our eye on since the early days, um, for sure. And that's shown through the amount of hours that we've put into. Um, monitoring the project. We did start the work in early 2016, um, and that was, or late 2016, uh, we did a, what we call an, ex an examination under Section 13 of our Act. Uh, and we went through the planning phase, and we were actually in um, full, fully into an audit at that point um, when the announcement was made for BCUC to take a look at that project and do a large review. And so at that point, we realized it wasn't really an appropriate space for us to be. We wanted to wait until that um, the Utilities Commission had done their review. Um, and so then we, during that period um, between when Site C was, the government made the decision to continue with Site C, we did a number of other work in BC Hydro, um, as well as we became the financial statement auditor for BC Hydro. So we've been very tapped into the aud that audit or that project um, for quite some time, but we haven't actually released a report. Um, again, in 2020, we started to, in the fall of 2020, we started to turn um, turn our minds to more of a contract management audit um, of the Site C. And as we were starting that planning, again, government announced um, that they hired a special advisor to conduct the review of the project. And um, that, that report has um, a summary of that report has been released. Um, and at this point, we are taking a look at it and deciding what further steps we will take on the audit or if we will continue with the work. So your, your question's a really valid one at this point. Um, I think for, um, from a, a general perspective around audit work, we do, and, and I think it shows in this, in this status report, when we are planning an audit, you know, we really think through where are we gonna add value we do have limited resources. We have a large audit universe that we cover and includes the entire GRE. Um, so we want to make sure that where we're focusing our audit hours and our audit staff is really going to add value to um, MLAs. And uh, Peter Milburn's report was re the summary of it was released. And as anybody who's read it, it, it is fairly comprehensive and covers a number of areas that we might have thought to do as an audit. So we have to look through that, think through that and decide where can we add value at this point? Um, you know, we do have, if you look at our coverage plan, we also have a number of other really important areas to look at, like substance use, um, the opioid crisis, response to COVID-19. So there's a number of areas that we need to think about where we want to put our scarce resources. And Site C is definitely one of those ones that we are thinking exactly through that. So your, your question is, is, um, is, is very valid at this point and is exactly at the place that we are um, contemplating where we would go forward. Okay, I really appreciate that, Laura. That was a appreciate that answer because I know in the report today it says you look to hope to resume it later on this year, depending on uh, the time allotments, of course. And looking at the Milburn report, so it just I was just trying to frame that in my head of you know where, where do you pick it up? I guess after five years, after all of that. So, so really appreciate that. Uh, I have a few people now. Uh, maybe I'll don't if uh, MLA Anderson doesn't mind, I'll just jump to uh, Russ Jones first because he might be adding something in here. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to follow up on what, what Laura said about the financial audit. As you can well imagine, we spend 
a few thousand hours on on doing that every year as well. So one of the key things that we do look at are the financial controls around Site C, as as you can imagine, in in terms of the amount of dollars that are spent. And uh, so so we're in constant contact with with uh, BC Hydro, and and they're 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 very helpful in in pointing us in 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 certain areas where they think we should be looking anyway. Um, and one of the things that they had done in the past was point us towards the contract with the the major company that's running uh, Site C. So, so it's not like we're we're not doing uh, a fair amount of work on Site C already, but it, it's more from the financial statement point of view at this point in time. Thanks, Ross, for that uh, addition. Appreciate that, MLA Anderson. Good morning. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my question is just. Um, you know, when we look at the Canadian context, how typical is it that audits get postponed? Um, or w- what we see in BC with this, and I, I know that there's a tremendous amount of work, and this isn't meant to be a criticism in any regard, but just curious, um, is this fairly common that when you look across the province that sometimes, you know, priorities shift or change and that audits that we um, you know, that your office hoped to do end up getting postponed or or is BC in some type of anomaly? Thank you. Yeah, my, my that's, that's, a, that's a, another wonderful question. And, and I thank you for that. And it makes a lot of sense, uh, I think, to ask me that. Uh, so thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm not alarmed by the number uh, of audits that have uh, been postponed, particularly when we get into the substance of uh, of why they are postponed. I would be more concerned if we looked at this list and said, you know, yeah, government said it's not good timing. Government said it's not good timing. I would be more concerned if that was, uh, you know, a pattern, but it's not here. Uh, you know, each of these makes uh, a lot of sense to me as to why the delays uh, are occurring. And when I was Auditor General in Nova Scotia, we 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 had delays that, you know, when things made sense, we we delayed them, and we also had the opposite. When things made more sense, uh, things made sense to advance things, um, we did advance them as well. So nothing here, based on my experience, that's causing me uh, to really pause. But you know, part of why we did this is just the the promotion of openness and and transparency, just to say, you know, we we invest time in these things, uh, and things can happen. Um, and if I was concerned. Um, you know, I would make a comment in a report like this to say, hey, you know, I'm concerned by A, B, and C. We need, we might need to have a discussion here uh, around um, some of the, the delays we're getting as not being reasonable. I think now as we move forward, we're, you know, we're going to be entering a, a, a challenging period. Um, as we, you know, come out of the pandemic um, to do audits in the area of health, to do audits in the area perhaps of the public service or or anywhere in government, um, you know, where people may be coming out of a, or are coming out of an unprecedented busy time perhaps, and uh, and all of a sudden here we are and and auditors, and auditors, uh, you know, show up wanting to audit the hard work folks have been doing over the last 15 months or 18 months. Um, depending on on when we start. So that'll be something uh, at my level, at the AG level, I'll be watching closely um, that I, you know, fully respect and get where people are coming from and the situation they're in. But a a number of these audit topics will have to proceed. I mean, the substance use is a good one, right? I mean, we put a delay on that at the request of government. But, you know, if if things keep progressing and and the dealing with the pandemic progresses, we will have to get started on that uh, right this summer. So we are going to watch that. And and I think it's a balance. But the short answer is uh, I'm not alarmed. Um, You know, it does happen. um, And and nothing here for you to, uh, I think, um, be particularly concerned about or have to take uh, action on other than, I think, being aware. My answers are always long, aren't they? <laughs> Actually, I appreciate your answers because they're wholesome enough where uh, it gives us as a as a committee a good understanding. And I will highlight for you, Michael, that you hit the 830 mark and you weren't challenged or corrected by any of your colleagues. So that was good. <laughs> Just throw that in from this morning. Um, any other questions from anybody on the committee? Yes. No, I don't see any, but I always like to give the opportunity to our uh, Comptroller General, uh, put him on the spot if there's any additions maybe before we move on. Uh, Carl, if that you want to add. 
Uh, no further comments. Uh, from my perspective, uh, all of the changes to the program make sense. I think it's a sign of maturity within an audit program that there's an annual review and reconsideration based on planning work uh, that, that help flesh out the subject matter. So I'm uh, quite pleased to continue working with the OAG on um, moving the plan forward. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Chair, can I make a final comment? Can I, or can I make one more comment? I just, I just genuinely um, want to thank uh, the entire committee and the folks who work for the committee for taking on the work we do uh, and considering our work so quickly and fully. It, it is wonderful for us. And I say that both with respect of the work you're doing and respect of the independence you have that you, you do what you want to do and I get it. But I do want to say, you know, as the Auditor General who leads an office full of people who do all this work, this makes a difference for us in terms of our, our own individual job satisfaction, um, you know, how engaged we are, because it's wonderful to see the committee taking up our work uh, so quickly. So I do want to say a genuine thank you, recognizing the full independence of the committee and, and you know, committees do what they want want to do, but uh, it certainly is a good thing in here um, for our morale and for our engagement to see a committee taking up our work so quickly. So I do want to express my thanks for that. Well, I appreciate that too. And the, um, you know, the committee has got a lot to look at because the reason why we want to try to stay on top of it is because of all of the, the work that your office is doing, lots of reports, lots of information, and uh, we could fall behind very quickly if we're uh, not careful as well. So, so thank you very much for that. Uh, seeing no further comments or questions and from the committee on, on this part of the agenda, maybe we'll just recess for uh, just like two minutes just to give our witnesses time uh, to move on and then we'll bring the committee back for the last part of our agenda. So just a two minute recess and thank you again, uh, Michael, to, to you and everybody on your team. It was great seeing you on this early Monday morning and uh, we'll, I know we'll see you really soon at our next meeting. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you, everyone. So we're just going to call the meeting uh, back to order. I appreciate everybody's time again. Uh, we have one other addition uh, that we've put onto the agenda today, and that is um, for the summary of activities report. Sorry, I'm going to reach over and grab my copy uh, that we have of our information. And so this one here, uh, just for the committee's uh, understanding or knowledge of this. So I hope everybody's obviously had time to go through this. Uh, we'll open it up right now for any uh, comments, suggestions, uh, any information that people would like to uh, add or see uh, explained through this. Uh, process obviously is once the committee has uh, approved this and we voted on it, then it gets presented in the legislature. For those who are on other committees, you know that process. If you're new, then that's kind of what we go through. And then uh, the deputy chair and myself will basically present it in the legislature once uh, this committee is satisfied with uh, the actual report. Uh, so towards the end of today, if the committee feels that uh, they're satisfied with all of this uh, and any additions or changes or suggestions made today, then we can vote on that as well. If we're not ready, obviously we won't today. But I open it up to uh, the committee now if there's any uh, comments, suggestions or questions regarding the report. While everybody's thinking about that, okay, actually, it's the MLA Sharma, I believe, I put her hand just up. A, just a question, Chair, if I can, just um, really curious if you can walk through how this report's put together, like who, just the basics of that, just being you, I'm curious. Yeah, no, really, really good question. Thank you for that. And for that, I'll actually turn things over to Jennifer, because of course, as you know, we have our, our clerks and all the assistants uh, behind the scenes who keep track of everything we discuss in our meetings, put the minutes together and compile it all uh, for us as a committee into this report, which is why it comes back to us to make sure it, it kind of meets the test and the accuracy of what we've done. So maybe Jennifer, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, not a problem. Thanks so much for the question. Um, I know sometimes these uh, these matters land on on members' desks, um, so I appreciate the opportunity to to provide a little further explanation. Um, so we do have our parliamentary committee's office team um, and our researchers who uh, put this together. So we have Ron Wall here, who's manager of committee research services. Lisa Hill, um, who's not here today, but she usually is, um, is the uh, committee research analyst and, and they work together um, to draft the report. Uh, it, is, it is a basic, uh, common layout report for all um, committee work. Uh, so it's typical across committees. Um, so it starts with sort of the composition, sets out the terms of reference. Um, usually there's a high level sort of comment about the work of the committee or something similar, and then it goes into um, the details. In this case, because it is a summary report, it provides an overview of each um, Auditor General report that the committee considered, in this case between December 20th, or sorry, 2020 and uh, March 31st, 2021. Um, so within that time frame, and then a summary of the questions uh, that members asked, um, as well as uh, as well as the answers that members received to their questions. At the back of this report, uh, because, because uh, in our office we do try to, to uh, carefully sort of collect all of the information that and all of the work that committees have done, we have added an appendix uh, which is just a very high level of uh, documenting the work that was completed by the previous committee but they didn't have an opportunity to report out on. Uh, so it's just uh, attached as an appendix and you'll, you'll notice it's really high level um, just to capture those details uh, if any were, anybody were to go back and, and look for that information. Uh, but happy to take any any more questions you might have. Emily Sharma, is that kind of? Yeah, just curious. I was and then a follow up. That's really helpful. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I guess as a follow up, does does it go to the chair and vice chair um, just to kind of give input on what's in there, or is it just kind of a very standard format? So, so yes to both. Um, it is a very standard format. And then also with most committee products, um, it is part of the role of the chair and deputy chair uh, to take for a, sort of a first glance and provide any um, first, uh, first comments that they may have before um, items go to the committee for uh, full consideration. Great, thank you. 
And just to flag again, as as Jennifer mentioned, uh, this is only covered up to March 31st, 2021. So I know we have had other meetings and other work that's been done by this committee since then, which will be compiled into the next report that we put forward. So just to flag that for uh, the committee and anybody else that's listening. Je Jennifer, not to uh, wordsmith at all, can you explain on page five? I missed this the first time when I read through it. Um, Page five, under the terms of reference, can you explain to me, please, when you go halfway down to A, so it's talking about, you know, the addition of the powers previously con conferred, and it goes in A, it says a point of its number. Is that legalese? Because to me, I would say a point of its members, but is that, what does that mean? Is it the same thing? Yeah, yeah, so... Um... So this is typical language that's actually included um, in all select standing committee terms of reference. And that's essentially exactly what it does mean um, is that it can, it can appoint subcommittees to take on tasks and delegate tasks to subcommittees. Those subcommittees are comprised of um, some of the members of, of the full committee. So yeah, the language uh, could certainly um, be a little bit more plain language, but that is indeed what, what it does mean. Well, I guess I could have asked uh, MLA Mercier to explain it to me, but uh, appreciate that. Is there um, is there anything then from the report that anybody wanted to flag, uh, have any questions or talk about? So maybe uh, we we do have to have a vote on that then, if if the committee feels comfortable with that. And I know Jennifer has the the wording, uh, but before we throw that up, I just want to thank. Uh, Jennifer uh, in the clerk's office there and all of the staff because uh, there is a lot of work uh, that goes in trying to um, herd the cats as they say with the work that we do uh, as elected officials and as always it's the staff behind the scenes I think that uh, does so much of the heavy lifting in the work so thank you Jennifer and Ron and Lisa I don't see Lisa on today but um, again thank you for all of the work because I went through this again and you know it's it's, it's a great summary, and it, I think it gives a lot of information of what the committee does as well. And I think for the public, it just shows that, you know, what we're doing as a committee and moving forward and working with the OAG. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, so with that, then, I believe we have uh, some actual wording if the committee uh, is pro if it feels uh, they're ready then. And so I'm looking for a motion to uh, accept this, but I'll, Jennifer will put the wording up on the screen again, if, I, if somebody's willing to move that motion. And unfortunately I've lost, by sharing the screen, I've lost everybody. So I'm not sure whose hand goes up there to make the motion. Uh, okay, MLA Mercy, I thank you. And then Jennifer will put it on the screen for you, Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the committee approve and adopt the report entitled Summary of Activities 2020-21 as presented today and further that the committee authorize the chair and deputy chair to work with committee staff to finalize any editorial changes to complete the supporting text. Thank you very much. Uh, probably no questions on that. No. So all those in favor then, please. Okay. Anyone opposed? And it is carried. So thank you very much, everyone. Jennifer, just before we move on, I know it's a busy day and early morning, but I wanted to give Jennifer, I think we had one more thing we had to do. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just one uh, final motion for the committee to consider, uh, asking that the chair present uh, the report to yeah. the Legislative Assembly at the earliest opportunity. Um, happy to, to screen share um, for a member to move. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. Uh, is that going to be moved by anyone then on the committee? Uh, MLA Taggart. Thank you, Chair. I move that on behalf of the committee, the chair present the report entitled Summary of Activities 2020-21 to the Legislative Assembly at the earliest available opportunity. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, all those in favor? Anyone opposed? And it is carried. Um, any further comments? Deputy Chair, are you good? I always like to make sure that 
Okay, just wanted to make sure. Thank you. And Jennifer, uh, thank you again for all your help today and, and with this report, you and everybody else in the office. Uh, not seeing any other comments, we'll just have a motion to adjourn. And uh, MLA Starchuk, thank you very much. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? And it is carried. Thank you, everyone. Have an amazing week. And uh, we'll be seeing each other soon at our next meeting. So have a great day. Thanks, everyone.